Hello! In this video, we'll be visually taking you guys through a Restro mod of a vintage Magnum, and audibly taking you through the history of this guitar brand, to the best of my knowledge. I'm possibly the third owner of this guitar question, considering it was gifted to me from someone who found it in the trash. Goals for this project, we were trying to bring it up to modern playing standards, which is going to be a challenge considering that, like, fresh off the shelf, this wasn't at modern playing standards. We are putting new tuners on, replacing the uh, open gear tuners with a single back plate, closed gear, and putting a Floyd Rose system in. Magnum Guitars. If you're like me and you like reading weird, crazy old forum posts, you might find the following interesting. Quote. I worked for Magnum for around 10 years. The Magnum guitar brand was owned and distributed by the Tilden Company of Madison Heights, Michigan. The early Magnum from the 70s until the early 80s were made by Ibanez. The late 80s through mid 90s were built by Samick and the makers of Court Guitars. Can't believe everything you read on the internet, but I've done some pretty, pretty decent research on another one of my guitars, which I believe is a Magnum. Backs up what this says, especially the fact that we got a lot of these around in Michigan, so I believe they were distributed here quite frequently. I'm gonna have a link for the uh, forum post in the description if you want to read a little bit more. That whole blog is old, but it's pretty interesting if you like these old weird guitars. But anyway, moving on. Being a Michigan resident, I've gotten to speak with a lot of older guitarists from all around the state, and plenty of them had something to say about Magnum guitars. A lot of them are like, real, real rose tinty glasses. Like, they're like, wow first guitar and they're like so excited that someone still cares about magnums and they're like yeah I remember having it and wish I still had it and I had to sell it to upgrade and all that and then some of the other ones are a little bit more realistic like they're they look back and they're like yeah it was my first guitar and it's either the reason they quit or to people being a little bit more realistic talking about how bad the quality was where like some played okay others were horrendous considering quality control is kind of all over the place back there for all brands like this one especially all over the place the fact that there's tons of them around in michigan and it wasn't hard for me to just talk and have older generations tell me about their first magnums really lends credit to the fact that there's probably a distributor in madison heights just pumping these things out to the local markets over the years, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out any information about this one you're about to see in the video. So if anyone even just has, like, a sale picture, like advertisements, anything like that, I'd be super interested. From what I could tell, Magnum isn't a maker. They're just a brand. It's just something that importers or exporters came up with, slap it on a guitar headstock so it stand out a little bit more on a shelf. You know, you're looking, you're like, I want a Gibson, I want a Fender, but those are, like, silly expensive. But then you see something that says Magnum, and then something that doesn't even have a label. You're gonna think like, well, I mean, at least this one might have some grounding in quality control. It might have a company, but it's all smoke and mirrors. It's literally just a little silk screen across a neck, probably made in a similar factory to the ones that have no labeling. And that also leads plenty of credence to the fact that these were shared makers, like, all different kinds of companies like early Samic, early Court, early Ibanez cranking out these blank headstock guitars and then them just getting something pasted on before they're shipped over to the states for mass distribution. Well, one thing I can definitely say about these guitars in general from the ones I've had my hands on over the years, they are cheap. Even the good ones are pretty cheap. Make a wonderful modding platform as you can see we're doing today, but man. All I could say is I did not expect when Andrew started routing into this thing, we we're gonna find out the entire body was MDF. That was kind of hilarious and a bit of a surprise to me. Okay. Jesus, it's made out of like composite wood. I know. That's why like, <laughs> is it going so easy? That's it's made out of MDF. Absolutely hilarious, actually. Wow. Jeez. A little bit more. Here we go. No, no, wait, 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 wait. Well, either way, regardless how you feel about the badge brand or the perceived quality, you can go on Reverb right now and find plenty of models in fantastic condition for like $200. If you're looking for something to work on and you just want to like tinker around, maybe route out the body like we're doing here, really, really invasive mods to a guitar and you don't feel comfortable doing it on something worth a lot, this is a phenomenal choice. And if you're real lucky, I've seen single cut Les Paul copies that seem a bit older. As far as I'm concerned, you may be holding an early Ibanez lawsuit. 
Now this whole project has got me thinking about the vintage market, a little something they call player's grade. That term is used to refer to guitars that normally cost more than some luxury cars, but are more reasonably priced because they've been handled extensively or have been modified a little too far past original spec. Even some sensible quality of life mods taint the prices dramatically in the vintage market. At least when we're talking mint versus player grade. If you can't see my air quotes, I just made them. With this in mind, when I see lesser known vintage guitars for sale, I always try them out. I always take a few minutes to pick one up, sit down in front of an amp, just to see. Because these guitars didn't sell much, they still don't sell for much. And there's no one looking trying to keep these things pristine. Like, no one's hoarding collections of random magnums in a room somewhere in a humidor. <sighs> At least that's, uh, that's the case for these brands. Don't get me started on Tiesco kind of becoming popular. That's a whole other video in itself. It was really surreal. There's a... I'll, I'll see if I can find it again and send it to you. It's a podcast where this really random... I say random because he's kind of weird. Um, musician from New York interviews this guy who literally wrote a book on, like, Tiesco's and Gaiatones and all, like, those 60s, 70s Japanese guitars. Uh -huh. And uh, he went to Japan to do a ton of his research. And he talked to the guy who designed his childhood guitar, and the guy was so just moved that this random American cared so much about, like, not just the guitarist, but, like, the history of them. He went back into his office and came back with the original blank he carved to design the body for it. What? And he was like, you want this, man? And he was like, oh, God, yeah, I want this. Oh, God, yeah. No one's afraid to repair these old, random, no-name guitars. No one's afraid to put modern parts on them. No one's afraid to fix them to bring them up to better playing standards. And as far as I'm concerned, they're around for a reason still. They're either around because one just hid in a basement this entire time, or they're around because someone was playing it the whole time. And those ones in particular, I think those ones passed some sort of gauntlet. The ones that were true lemons got pitched. The ones that played exceptionally compared to their compatriots were passed on to new generations continually, competing in some Darwin-esque battle royale quality control. Even if they don't play well immediately, I look at the potential because someone didn't throw it out for a reason, or in the case of mine, saved it from the trash heap. You can sometimes find one of these old guitars that may look horrible on the outside, but then when you take a closer look, it's been refretted. The wiring's obviously been redone. You take a peek inside, it has new components. The bridge has been completely replaced. And then it plays amazingly. And you know what? The best part? It's like $150. So the way I look at it is you can buy a brand new Squire Epiphone, 150 bucks. You get this vintage tone, kind of reminiscent build quality, you know? And they're, they're gonna work. They're gonna be great. But if you already have nice playing guitars and you're just out there looking for something unique, like you're past the point of trying to find something functional and you're just looking for, for fun, check these out. They're worth it. Have a good night, everybody.